Welcome to Shaka Extra Time. I am Paul Ndiho and joining me on Facebook live is Shaka Sally himself aka the Kawale Kid. Hello Shaka. Hello Paul. How are you? Usually terrific uh, but I hope that this time around uh, my friend Studio 54 becomes technologically and environmentally friendly. Well, on that note, let me start by apologizing to all our viewers. Uh, last, uh, the last two weeks we had some technical challenges, but I hope uh, that has been uh, fixed uh, because um, I see the technicians say that uh, everything seems to be working fine. Uh, straight away, let's go to uh, maybe let me also welcome to uh, all our Facebook uh, viewers who are watching us uh, from all over the world. Uh, Shaka Extra Time is a place where you get to ask questions. Uh, today we are talking about uh, Kenya and Rwanda, the upcoming elections in both uh, countries. I think let's start uh, in uh, Kenya. Uh, things are heating up in Kenya. It looks like uh, uh, both uh, candidates, especially the major candidates, uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta and his main rival, Raila Odinga, uh, once again uh, tussling each other uh, on uh, the stage. Your take, Shaka. It looks very interesting, uh, especially when uh, I watched a bit of uh, last night's debate, uh, which of course uh, was expected to be between uh, uh, incumbent President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta and uh, former Kenyan Prime Minister Raila Amoro Odinga. And uh, you can't believe it, but uh, Odinga actually found himself pretty much debating himself. Very interesting. And this is a man, by the way, According to some of the most recent public opinion polls, if in fact those polls really uh, go for anything, he actually appears to be ahead, even though the race clearly looks like uh, it's too close to call. Uh, what seems to be uh, the issues that these uh, candidates are talking about? I don't really think that uh, uh, issues are very, very important in a lot of these races. Uh, uh, you know, Paul, elections, it seems to me, especially in Africa, really, are won uh, on the basis of uh, the messenger, as opposed probably to the message, uh, and also how that individual probably uh, succeeds in terms of, uh, uh, you, know, some, you know, developing some kind of, or instilling some kind of inspiring interest, at least emotionally. When some people are asked why they actually like candidate B, as opposed to candidate A, uh, they seem to talk about uh, things like charisma, things like uh, when that person opens the mouth, how does he actually make you feel? Even though, if in fact the race has to be based on the issues, I frankly think that uh, the incumbent president, Uhuru Kenyatta, has uh, a lot of work to do because, let's face it, the economy simply does not look good. And there is a saying that, uh, you know, no politics supersedes the politics of the stomach. Until recently, you had actually a shortage of maize, you know, which is obviously a staple for most Kenyan families. So people found it very difficult, for example, to access maize. Uh, some would even say Sukuma Wiki, which pushes the weak. Uh, it's very difficult to buy sugar, it's very expensive. So is milk. And guess who controls the single largest dairy industry in Kenya? It is the Kenyatta family, Brookside, you know, towards Westlands and all that kind of stuff. And people simply cannot, most people cannot afford milk. It happens to be much more expensive, by the way, than in fact buying a liter of petrol, or what you call gasoline right here. Uh, but uh, one could argue that uh, uh, this is a, a result of uh, the na natural causes. It's not a political thing. Uh, wh wh how, what do you, how would you respond to that kind of uh, uh, stuff? You're probably referring to drought, correct? Yes. When we talk about drought, do you know how many years 
California, the single largest state in the United States, has experienced drought. And yet, let's face it, life is going on normally in California. Look, when you talk about uh, fam famine or you talk about uh, drought and what have you, it has a lot to do with man. It has to, a lot to do with somebody who is supposed to be in charge. In this particular case, I think there is the issue of somebody not being in charge of the store, as they say in the United States. And then you have the issue of corruption. You have the issue of alleged uh, nepotism and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you have a majority population which is made up of young people, the youth. You have too much percentage of unemployment. Mm. People don't frankly know what they are likely to do tomorrow. So why should they in fact vote for you to continue doing more of the same? So this is a very, very unique, uh, I think, opportunity for the former Prime Minister, mm. Raya Odinga because he is the type of person who obviously uh, is calling out to the incumbent for not doing what he is expected to do. And guess what? This man who should have been in a position to defend his record does not in fact participate on the debate because he says it really doesn't mean anything and yet he's supposed to be a public servant. So he should have been there hmm. to defend his record. Uh, interesting. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of, uh, of uh, people in Kenya. I've uh, spoken to some of our colleagues uh, from uh, Kenya. I th they say that uh, the political landscape right now in Kenya uh, looks, uh, if things went the way things are looking according to the opinion polls, uh, uh, the, the main rival, Raila Odinga, might actually end up uh, winning. Uh, I don't know what they're basing their assessment on, but uh, it looks like uh, he has an upper hand. There was a poll that came out that showed him uh, leading by a few points uh, ahead of uh, the, uh, the incumbent uh, president. What makes these two candidates unique? In fact, there are two public opinion polls, one by um, a local uh, pollster, the other one by an American, actually, uh, polling company. Mm. So the thing is, uh, let's face it, uh, you see, first of all, if you look for the evidence, Evidence will suggest to you that Raila Odinga did not, in fact, lose the last two elections. Mm. We're talking about uh, the 2013. Uh, that one was supposed to be, according to some of the information I have been seeing, it ended up being a state project. Mm -hmm. uh, simply, in fact, uh, something like more than rigging. The one earlier in 2007, you know the story. Uh, Kibaki, there is evidence, stole the election. So this man, in fact, has actually been not losing the last two elections, uh, even though we do not have evidence that uh, he actually won. So let's face it, this man has support across the country. Uh, it used to be, for example, that uh, the team of Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto would obviously uh, feel comfortable in central province of, uh, because of uh, uh, the Kikuyu community mm. and would also feel comfortable in the great uh, Rift Valley mm. because of the Karenjigun community. Now the Karenjigun community as we talk is split because there is another interesting Ruto mm -hmm. whose first name is Isaac, certainly not William, and happens to be the governor of Bomet uh, near the beautiful Kericho Tia state. Mm -hmm. This man commands a lot of respect uh, he has uh, been, in fact, drawing crowds for NASA, uh, the main opposition political uh, party. So it looks like uh, the Rift Valley is going to be split because the Masa is also happened to be, in fact, uh, supportive of Raira Odinga, the Pokot, the Turkanas, and some of these smaller states. And then you go to the Kamba territory, mm -hmm. the land where, of course, uh, uh, Odinga's running mate, uh, Stephen Karonzi Musyoka, happens to be the king. These guys are behind NASA. Then you have the coast, where you have Governor Joho and Kingi and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So to be very honest with you, when you look at the map of Kenya, and then you look at Nairobi also, by the way, Nairobi is the territory for the opposition. Uh, in fact, you even have uh, the incumbent governor, Kidero, who happens to be 
uh, a man of ODM, Odinga, and all that kind of stuff, who marries uh, one of the great political sionists, of course, uh, uh, daughter, Tom Boyer. Mm. Now, can he, Odi can Raila Odinga win an election simply by being supported by the central province? Mm. I doubt. I don't think the mathematics is there. Mm. I, I hate to break it to you, but uh, it looks like uh, once again we are experiencing some technical problem. I don't see the show live, but uh, uh, let's go ahead and just, I uh, uh, guess, uh, keep going. Uh, let's uh, shift our goalposts uh, to uh, Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda is also having an election. Uh, from what I've seen, it looks like uh, President uh, Paul Kagame has uh, these uh, huge, huge uh, uh, crowds and the so-called opposition doesn't have anybody even attending their rallies. Uh, your, your thoughts on that? It is very interesting that uh, you refer to actually what is going on in Rwanda as an election. Have you ever seen any country, sincerely, perhaps with the exception of Equatorial Guinea, uh, where you have those types of circumstances, where, for example, a country claims to be a, to be a multi-party system, and yet everything that you see uh, tells you that you are looking at a one-party state. Mm. Why do I say that? I say that because in Rwanda, the facts will tell you that there is not even a semblance of a difference between the ruling Rwandese Patriotic Front and the state, or what you call the government, the two are fused. This is not a place where, for example, you have an official uh, who happened to serve in the gendarmerie or the police who can actually be playing a police role which requires that individual to be neutral. Mm. That person should, in fact, be characterized as a police officer who pretty much is partisan, serves the interests of the ruling Rwandese Patriotic Front. The Electoral Commission is picked by an individual who also runs in the same election. So it's frankly just like two opponents mm -hmm. who are supposed to be meeting in a stadium uh, in a football match. And one of the opponents happens to have the power or the privilege of appointing the referee appointing the line is men, and probably influencing or deciding, in fact, who becomes a spectator. <laughs> I mean, if you have those types of circumstances, sincerely, Paul, do you really have to even worry about what is, uh, what is likely to be the results, especially when that particular individual who is in charge, he scores at will, and yet when he sees the opponent ge getting into position to score, he has the means, the power, and the ability to shift the goal post. Uh, you, you remind me of uh, Joseph Stalin. Remember that name? Mm -hmm. Who once said that uh, it doesn't matter how many people show up uh, to vote, but uh, what matters is uh, who counts the vote. So are you suggesting that in this particular case, uh, it really doesn't matter about uh, the crowds that we see. What matters is who is going to uh, count the vote. Oh, yes. Apart from uh, the optics that uh, you were talking about, how, for example, incumbent uh, President uh, uh, Paul Kagame is addressing uh, mammoth crowds, uh, you also know, for example, that uh, he himself is on record saying that uh, the election results are in no doubt. Everybody knows who is going to win. And then he said, in fact, it is not because of what is going to happen on August 4th, but in fact, is what happened in 2015 when this petition came around uh, seeking to amend the Constitution so that he could run for the third term. In fact, what came out of that uh, petition is not even a Constitution in a way because they specifically spell out Major General Paul Kagame's name, retired but certainly not tired, as the man who will serve almost for the next probably so many years, so that by the time you look back, he will probably have been in power for 34 years. Mm. Um, and let's face it, that is no longer a constitution. That is a personal manifesto. The man says that if you looked at the results of the petition, that should explain to you 
who the Rwandese like. Can you believe there were only 10 people? I am talking about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, mm -hmm. who essentially expressed a different point of view. Let's be honest. We know from the time we are kids that the name of Jesus Christ <laughs> invokes someone that is so popular, so famous. If you're a Muslim, you also know Prophet Muhammad. Right. You can't really go against Prophet Muhammad. But if those two individuals, frankly, were running for office, I can guarantee you, Paul, that they will find themselves probably uh, getting fewer percentages than the strong man of Rwanda. So the <laughs> man, in fact, is more popular, more famous than the two prophets combined, Jesus Christ and Prophet Muhammad. So, so in other words, you are suggesting that he's a god, right? Well, I don't see how you could possibly describe him as a human being, really, if you look at uh, the circumstances. This man, at least if he's a human being, uh, there is ample evidence that suggests, for example, that as far as the Rwandese are concerned, he happens to be God's gift to, to the Republic of Rwanda. <laughs> Interesting. Let's go to, uh, before we go to the comments, uh, let's uh, talk uh, about uh, Rwanda's uh, electoral commission that uh, disqualified some of uh, the candidates, uh, and including, uh, of course, the only female candidate, uh, uh, Diane Shema Rigala, uh, saying that uh, they didn't uh, uh, fulfill the requirements uh, such as uh, collecting enough uh, uh, supporting signatures. Uh, but Diane had earlier uh, challenged the electoral body, and I quote, uh, if you are men, you should allow us uh, to compete in a free, fair uh, election. If I you are men or if you are men enough? Uh, uh, maybe I misquoted uh, her, but uh, uh, I, I guess you get the point. Uh, your thoughts? I heard Does a, a, a lady like Diane, a young uh, person like Diane, have a future in Rwanda? Well, depending, depending on, of course, uh, who is in charge of Rwanda, uh, there is no question that um, the young lady is, first of all, uh, uh, very pretty, uh, very smart or intelligent, uh, remarkably articulate. Uh, she knows the issues. As a matter of fact, uh, she was spot on, really. Uh, when she was addressing some time uh, uh, press conferences, which, by the way, she says she could not get anywhere uh, to address those press conferences, so they would end up, in fact, at her house. Uh, I heard Diana on Nightline Africa over the weekend. It was very, very interesting because Peter Kilote, the anchor of Nightline Africa, put the question to her, that, but really, how can you say uh, that uh, you were wrongly disqualified? Because as far as the Rwandan Electoral Commission, you simply could not raise 600 signatures mm -hmm. from 12 provinces or something of that sort. She actually responded to Peter that not only did she have 600 signatures, but she in fact made sure that she had about twice as much as 600. But then she says, Peter, when you talk about the Rwanda Electoral Commission, what are you talking about? You're talking about a commission that serves at the discretion of the ruling party, the Rwandese Patriotic Front, whose chairman happens to be also president, Major General Paul Kagame, retired, but certainly, as you can see, not tired. Uh, le 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 let's go to a Facebook uh, comment uh, here from Rwanda. Uh, David uh, Kilimwe Ankari. Uh, Rwanda's electoral commission is useless uh, like, uh, because it's a Tusi junta. Well, what more evidence do you want? Uh, it's precisely what uh, Diana uh, Ruigara was saying. Uh, she's talking about how the fact of the matter is you cannot hold an election that you would call free, fair, transparent, and credible. Again, for the circumstances that uh, I pretty much, you know, shared with you. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a situation here where President Kagame, with his free hands, is actually boxing Havineza uh, and Mpaimana. And yet, both Mpaimana and Havineza 
have their hands conveniently tied behind their backs and their feet tied together. But they are being told to counterpunch. How do you, how the hell do you counterpunch? Mm. That's the reason why you are even seeing on the ground in Rwanda, you're looking at the optics. You're looking at Kagame in a security box. But you're looking at so many people, like a sea of people, waving the RPF flags. And yet, these people, I am told, from some of the people that uh, are on the ground, have witnessed what has been going on, that in fact, you're looking at a military or security operation. That these people actually, uh, you can't say mobilize, because mobilize, somebody says, that, is, that invokes something positive. You're talking about people who, in fact, are ordered forcibly to go to a, a particular location because the president is going to be there. And then you contrast, you compare and contrast with, for example, the fact that uh, the other two gentlemen who are also campaigning for the same position, the presidency, have absolutely no audience. They have no spectators. Uh, and in fact, there are reports suggesting that even in some places where they may have had some people, there has been an interference of security forces and supporters of incumbent president Paul Kagame to make sure that there's nobody. Yeah, Shaka, I'll push back a little bit on that. Uh, do you have any evidence uh, to suggest that uh, actually these security forces are forcing people to go and attend these uh, rallies? To be very honest with you, I do not have it right now in my fingers, but I am talking with the people who happen to be in the knowledge, including, by the way, some people who are members of the Rwandese Defense Forces, some members who are in intelligence. They are talking to me. They are talking to others, talking about the same thing. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if you would get some photographic evidence of some of these things if you actually went to the social media and what have you. I am sure you'll get some of these things. Uh, Shaka, what is uh, President Paul Kagame scared of? Uh, he's a guy who is credited uh, for stopping uh, the genocide. He's a guy who has uh, taken that country from uh, the bad days uh, to the good days. Uh, they boast of a greater uh, economic recovery. They boast of, they boast of a greater uh, uh, economic development. Uh, when you compare Rwanda to other countries, uh, the difference is like day and night. Uh, so what is uh, President Kagame scared of? That is very debatable, Paul. Very debatable. As a matter of fact, uh, you should look at uh, what is coming out of London this week on Kagame. The British media is even criticizing its own government for what it says, giving aid to somebody they characterize as a dictator. That's not me. I'm not the one who ri who's writing that. If you went and read those, some of those stories, you say, wait a minute. There was a story recently which even came uh, through another yes, very right. important uh, British uh, global uh, the Daily media. Mail? No, I'm talking about uh, The Economist. Mm. The Economist said, look, everything that uh, people say Kagame is, that he's a model for Africa and what have you, it is not. That's not me. It's uh, The Economist. And you have the sun crying everywhere. You have evidence. Look, you even have human beings, individuals, who happen to have actually been senior members of the Rwandese ruling party and the Rwandese defense force. You have a guy like uh, Lieutenant General Foster Kayumba Nyamwasa. He was, this is a fact, he was the military chief of staff of the Rwandan army. He was also, and he was of course promoted by President Kagame. He did not promote himself. He was at one time head of the Rwandese intelligence. He was his country's ambassador or high commissioner to New Delhi, to India. Guess what? He's now living in exile in South Africa. And he's been saying almost everything except that probably people do not want to hear. Recently, I heard him on the radio also saying that the type of democracy that is in Rwanda, if there is such a thing as a democracy, it is the same type of democracy that you would associate with North Korea.
Interesting. Uh, let's stay in East Africa. Let's go to uh, Kakoza Justice from uh, Uganda. Uh, he wants to know your opinion on uh, uh, age, uh, age limit removal from the Ugandan constitution. I don't really have a problem with uh, uh, removing the age cap because it is true, as some have argued, that uh, you can even be a terrific president or a terrific head of state uh, when you're past 75. But what I do disagree with is, for example, having a situation where a major uh, clause in a constitution, something frankly that uh, uh, should not be really uh, changed unless you have, for example, uh, a referendum, all that kind of stuff, the articles that are entrenched, is that if you change that article, it should not be for the benefit or for the personal or political benefit of the incumbent president. It should come into effect after that incumbent president has stepped aside. But in this particular case, we are talking about politics. Again, does that really uh, have the respect, the integrity, that document I'm talking about? that you should in fact call it a constitution, it ceases to be a constitution. And in fact, it should cease because it becomes something akin to a personal manifesto. Because what is Yoweri Museven trying to become? I mean, he's already, we know, obviously, an imperial president or a presidential monarch. So he wants to be a king with a dynasty, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, I can't wait to see the coronation of a king. Well, and why not? <laughs> then you see Emperor Jean Bedero Bokassa so, of but, the Central Republic. But, but let me push back. Uh, we still have maybe time for uh, one or two questions. Uh, let me push back on that. Uh, uh, President Tum Seven is not actively uh, saying that all oh, you guys are want to change uh, the constitution. Uh, uh, maybe he, the, his supporters are the people fronting the idea of him. Uh, uh, changing the constitution. Uh, your thoughts on that? He's very smart and he probably has taken Ugandans for granted for a very, very long time, thinking Ugandans are, are very stupid. Because let's face it, if in fact he's interested as he claims, then why doesn't he stop those people who you say are, her suppo are his supporters, who are actually uh, talking about the possibility of changing that particular article so that he can become president for life? It was the same story, by the way, back in 2005, when they changed the article to remove term limits. He said he was not interested. But guess what? He was actually behind the scenes facilitating, he said, which of course someone would call bribing members of parliament, each of them $3,000 only. $3,000, my friend. And they changed the constitution so that the man can be a life president and the last time I checked, he did not disagree with them. Uh, Shaka, we are running out of time. Uh, what are you talking about uh, tomorrow on Straight Talk Africa? Tomorrow we are, of course, uh, looking at uh, the upcoming Rwandan or process of the Rwandan electoral uh, process. And, of course, the August 4th election, which some pundits, in fact, say probably is better to call it a selection. Interesting. Uh, I look forward to watching uh, the next uh, edition of uh, Straight Talk Africa. And to all our viewers, I say thank you. Uh, at least for today, I don't have to apologize to you. At least the show is on air. And thank you so much uh, for being part of uh, this uh, broadcast. Thank you, Shaka. You're most welcome, Paul. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm.